Amen. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it is good to be here uh, with you for this camp meeting. Um, I am excited. I hope you are too. So we're going to try that again. Um, because the theme of the, the uh, camp meeting is revival. And by the sound of uh, what I just heard, we are in need of revival. So I'm excited. How about you? Yeah. Amen. Amen. We are going to, uh, we're going to open the word of God tonight. And um, the theme uh, of this uh, camp meeting is based on revival. I believe that we are in need of revival. How many of you believe that? Yeah. I believe that Jesus is coming soon. How many of you believe that? Yeah. And so we're going to be talking about how do we, uh, as a as a church, as a people, experience revival, and how can we be prepared for the second coming of Jesus Christ? So I invite you to pray with me uh, as we uh, prepare to open the Word of God. Heavenly Father, I want to ask in a special way, Lord, that you would take the message that you have put upon my heart, Lord, and that you would speak to your people. Please, Lord, set us on fire. Set our hearts burning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I've entitled the message for this evening, The Eleven Are Coming. The Eleven Are Coming. I invite you to open your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10. And to set the foundation for the message uh, tonight. Revelation 10, we're going to look at verses 9. To 11. In Revelation chapter 10, verses 9 to 11, uh, John the Revelator is in vision and he sees an, uh, an angel, according to Revelation chapter 10, come to him. And the angel has in his hand a little book. And I want you to notice uh, what the Bible says. Revelation 10, verse 9. Um, the Bible says, And I went unto the angel, and he said unto me, and said unto him, Give me the little book. That is the little book that was open in his hand. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. It shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as what? <laughs> Honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, it was bitter. It, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. So I have a question for you. If I were to offer you some kind of food and tell you that the food would make your better billy, your, your, <laughs> your, <laughs> your belly bitter, how many of you would go ahead and eat? Would anyone eat? No, no, no. I, I would find it very difficult to eat if someone told me, yeah, this is going to make your belly bitter. But the, the, the text we just read said that it would be sweet in the mouth. How many of you like sweet things? <laughs> Let me suggest to you that, that what, what John is being given here uh, is very simply the word of God. Amen? Amen. It's the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So this writing in the book is simply the word of God. But, but according to Psalm 119 verse 103, the psalmist writes, How sweet are thy words unto my taste, yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. How many of you believe the word of God is as sweet as honey? And so let me suggest to you that in the Bible... Bitterness simply points to bitter experiences, disappointments. May I suggest to you that John the Revelator was so interested in the sweetness of the word that he was willing to suffer the bitterness. Let me rephrase it. What is it that keeps us through bitter times? It's the word of God. And so while when you become a Christian, you often run into these bitter experiences, but what we're about to see tonight is that it is the sweetness of God's word that, main, that keeps us even in bitter times. Amen? Amen? So I invite you to turn back with me 
to the book of Luke chapter 24, where we're going to discover a bitter experience. The book of Luke chapter 24. And let me give you the backdrop. In Luke 24, uh, the disciples have just had a bitter experience. Jesus, the one that they thought was the Messiah, has been dead for three days. And I want you to notice Luke 24, verse 13. The Bible says, And behold, two of them went that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was from Jerusalem, about threescore furlongs. And as they talked together of all these things which happened, it came to pass that while they communed together and reasoned, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were holden so that they should not know him. All right, so Jesus draws near. He's alive, but they don't know it. The Bible says their eyes were holden so that they could not uh, identify him. Remember, they had just gone through a bitter experience. The Bible goes on to say that Jesus, as he draws near, he said unto them, What manner of communication are these that ye have one to another as you walk and are sad? And one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered, saying unto him, Art thou only a stranger in Jerusalem and has not, has not known the things which are come to pass there in these days? And Jesus said unto them, What things? And they begin to tell Jesus all the reasons they have to be discouraged. Any one of you ever done that? All the reasons you have to be bitter. And then I want you to notice what happens. How many of you are familiar with this story? Because in the story, uh, Jesus says, down in verse 25, Then he said unto them, O fools and slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to do what? Enter into his glory. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Pause for a moment. Let's say that you died, and in some miraculous way you came back to life. You knew your family was, was discouraged, was, was, was depressed, was you know, just having a bitter experience. What would be the first thing that you would do? Don't get any you know, crazy thoughts. <laughs> But how many of you would simply, in order to get your family to, to stop being discouraged, how many of you would simply just show yourself and say, here I am, I'm alive. Jesus does not do that. Instead, what he does in the midst of their bitter experience, he gives them a Bible study. Oh man, you're not feeling it. <laughs> He gives them a Bible study. The Bible says, beginning from Moses and the prophets, he expounded unto them in the scriptures all the things concerning himself. Do you know what he was doing? He was breaking bread. He was breaking bread. And so the Bible tells us that, that, that as they have this study, uh, in verse 30, it came to pass, as he sat at meat with them, he took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to them. Remember, there was, he was saying, I have to go now. They were like, no, don't go, stay with us. And, and then he breaks bread, and when he breaks bread, their eyes were opened, and they knew him. They saw him. They recognized him. And then they said these words in verse 32. They said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way and while he opened to us the scriptures? The dis these disciples had what I call heartburn. <laughs> that is my goal uh, uh, tonight and over these next few meetings is to give you heartburn. By the way, when do you get heartburn? After you eat. It's going to wait, man. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's when you get heartburn, after you eat. So, so, so the Bible tells us, now, now I want you to notice this. So in verse, verse uh, uh, let's go down to verse uh, 36. In fact, no, let's, not, let's go to verse 33. And they rose at the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them. So how many did they just find? Eleven. These are the eleven disciples because one is dead. Who is that one? Judas, okay? So the 11, uh, 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 th these other disciples go to the 11, and then the Bible says that Jesus appeared unto them. Verse 36, Jesus, uh, uh, they spoke thus, saying, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said, Peace be unto you. And then he asked them for food, and then I want you to notice this. Verse 43, or verse uh, 45. Let's look at verse 44. 
it says, Then he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, and all these things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Jesus breaks the bread of life to the eleven. I got a question for you. How many of you have ever had a Bible study where, I mean, I want you to think about how deep this Bible study must have been. That the disciples, as they're on the road to Emmaus, they forget that they were depressed. They forget that they were discouraged. How many of you ever had a Bible study where you discovered something and you were so excited, it just like, you, your mind just went like, what? Anyone ever had years? I want you to imagine what kind of Bible study that must have been as Jesus goes back to the scriptures and he begins to break open the word of God with himself as the center. You see, beloved, the, the, the key to revival is heartburn. Oh, no, 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 no. The key to revival, beloved, the, the disciples, before they went to that upper room, right? 40 days later, before they went to that upper room, they had had an experience with Christ where Christ began to open the scriptures to them and show them that the scriptures were all about him. Jesus said, search the scriptures for in them you think you have what? Eternal life and these are they which testify of me. How many of you remember albums? Remember those things? <laughs> albums? The things that used to have pictures in them and... You know, we don't, we don't do that today, right? It's all Facebook, right? Albums. You ever see a picture that you never saw before of someone and, you, and it kind of gave you a new insight into your, your grandmother or your... Ever seen one of those? You never had that experience? Listen to me. The Bible is God's album of his son. Every page is full of pictures of his son. And as we begin to study the Bible, looking for Jesus in the scriptures, something begins to happen in our, our hearts. We begin to experience heart burn. I remember when I was studying the Bible once and I saw, I'm looking at the story of David, David and Bathsheba. And Bathsheba, you know the whole story with David. He has Uriah killed and he impregnates Bathsheba. And then the prophet Nathan comes to him and said, you have sinned. And David recognizes his wrong, and he repents right th then and there. And then the prophet Nathan says, uh, 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 you have sinned, but your sins are forgiven. However, your child is going to die. Anyone ever read that story? Yeah. And thought, man, how unfair. But listen to this, beloved. Here's what we know about this child of David. We know this. Number one, it was a boy. So listen carefully. The son of David having done no wrong. <laughs> Wait a minute, what? Yeah, the son of David, having done no wrong, dies that someone else might live. Does that sound familiar? Christ in all the scriptures. When we begin to see the pictures of Christ, something begins to happen in our hearts. So I want, I want to take you back to the book of Genesis. You know, in the book of Genesis, uh, let me break it down to you if I can. Genesis uh, uh, has uh, six major figures. The first one is Adam, and, and Adam covers chapters like one, two, and three. And then you have, or up to about five. Then you have Noah, who covers from chapters six to about chapters 11. And then you have Abraham, and then who else? Isaac, and then who else? Jacob, and then the book of Genesis closes uh, with Joseph. Yes? Yeah. Do you know that all these people are figures of Christ? Do you know that just like Adam, the first Adam, was put to sleep and his side was opened up so that his bride came out of his side, so Jesus Christ is a second Adam who was put to sleep and his side opened up at the cross so that his bride, the church... Do you know that just as Noah was lifted up above the earth and all men were drawn unto him? <laughs> so Jesus Christ was the second Noah who was lifted up above the earth so that all men were drawn unto him? Do you realize that just as Abraham left his father's house to go out into a strange land, that Jesus left his father's house to go out into a strange land. 
Just as Isaac was given up by the father as a sacrifice, so Jesus was given up by the father as a sacrifice. Just as Jacob gained the birthright over his older brother, his twin, who, by the way, had sold his birthright for what? Food. Do you know that Jesus Christ has a twin? You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> Jesus is the second Adam. Oh, man, y'all don't feel me. Yeah, the first Adam was also a son of God, but guess what? He too sold his birthright for food. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. And, and beloved, finally, uh, uh, ju just as Joseph was betrayed by his own and, and sold for silver and, and, and betrayed and put in prison for a crime he did not commit, even though Potiphar knew he did not commit that crime, and just as he, as he ended up between a butler and a baker too, <laughs> and just as at the end of three days, one of them would be, would be uh, uh, saved and the other lost, so Jesus Christ the second Joseph was, was betrayed by his own, sold for silver, even though it was known that he was innocent, placed between two thieves. Huh. Christ in all the scriptures. When we begin to see Christ unfolded in the scripture, something begins to burn in our hearts. We begin to say, man, I can't wait to share this. <laughs> you have problems sharing with people? You have problems like, what shall I share with my, with my friend who needs to know? My, uh, my... Let me tell you something. When you begin to find Jesus in the scriptures, you too, like the disciples will say, did not our hearts burn? And when your heart is burning, you cannot be held back. So, beloved, I want, let, let's go back to the book. Oh, by the way, oh, ooh, ooh, check this out. <laughs> book of Genesis, right? Same guys, Adam, and then who? Noah, and then Abraham, and then Isaac, and then Jacob, and then Joseph. Listen carefully, listen. Adam, the whole book of Genesis, by the way, is about Jesus. Did you know that? Let, let me show you something. Adam represents the beginning of creation, Amen. Yeah, Noah represents uh, uh, the result of sin. You look at the story of Noah, it shows what the result of sin is. You put those two stories together, and what do you have? You have the story of earth's creation and the result of mankind's fall. Amen? Yeah, then you have Abraham, who became the father of a great nation. Who is that nation? Israel. So if you put Adam, Noah, and Abraham together, you basically have in outline form the whole story of the Old Testament. Yeah? Who comes after Abraham? Isaac. What was the big deal with Isaac? He was the one that was almost what? Sacrificed. That's pointing us specifically to who? Jesus. So if you put Adam, Noah, Abraham, and Isaac together, you have the whole story of the Old Testament in shadow form. But check this out. Who comes after Isaac? Jacob and Esau, his twin, right? Now remember, Jacob was the younger. The birthright belonged to Esau, but because he rejected it, it went to, it went to Jacob. Do you know that in the Old Testament, there is a literal, I'm sorry, in the New Testament, there is a literal Israel and then a spiritual Israel? Do you realize that the literal Israel rejected its birthright and therefore the birthright went to the younger twin? <laughs> but wait, there is more. <laughs> Who comes after Jacob? Yeah, yeah. Jacob is a story of the New Testament church. Are you with me? So from Adam all the way down to Jacob, just in shadow form, it takes us from the beginning of time all the way down to the New Testament church. Now, 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 now comes Joseph. And remember this about Joseph. Joseph had been sent ahead to prepare a place for his brothers. Y'all are not feeling me. You are not feeling me. Heartburn somebody. <laughs> but, but, but before the brothers could enter into the place that, had been, that Joseph had been sent ahead to prepare. By the way, they didn't. 
the 11. <laughs> the 11 did not recognize Joseph. And they were coming looking for bread. Oh, yeah. Uh, huh. Right, so watch this. Before, before Joseph, now he sees his brothers and he's like, oh, these are my brothers. These are the ones that betrayed me. These are the ones that sold me. All right, hmm, looks like the father sent me ahead to prepare a place for them, but you know what? I'm not going to let them into this place yet because I don't know if they've changed. So before they enter this place, I'm going to investigate. Man, you're not filthy. You're not. Mm -hmm. I'm going to investigate. So how's it, how does he investigate? Well, let, let's make, here, here's what we'll do. Let's see how they treat one another. <laughs> I'm going to take one captive just like I was sold, and let's see how they respond now. In fact, Joseph's main test was, how do you treat one? Do you love one another? <laughs> because if you love one another, then I'll know that you've changed. Beloved, let me tell you something. We are in a, we're in a judgment time right now. And the heavenly Joseph, you, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah? yeah, the heavenly Joseph it, it, is there watching to see, hmm, let's see how you treat one another. By the way, the main person Joseph wanted to know how, you, how they treated was who? Benjamin. Who was Benjamin? He was the least of these. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. How you treat the least of these in so much as you have done, you have done it unto who? Unto me. By the way, Benjamin's name, when his mother was dying, Benjamin called, so his mother called him Benoni, meaning son of sorrow. But his father said, no, 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 call him Benjamin, meaning son of the right hand. So Benjamin himself was a type of Christ. So Christ, Joseph was saying, listen, how you treat Benjamin is how you treat me. So I'm, ke I'm keeping Benjamin captive. Let's see what you guys do. And when the brothers showed that they were willing to lay their lives down for the least of these, Joseph said, okay, you're ready. Enter into the king. <laughs> Beloved, listen to me. God is not looking at you to ask you in this test, what do you know? I mean, don't get me wrong. You need to know. But beloved, listen carefully. It's not just about what you know. It's about who you know. And who you know will reflect upon how you respond, how you behave, how you treat one another. Greater love has no man than this. I mean, lay his life down for his friends. But beloved, I want to switch gears here because there, there's something else that I, that I want to show you with the story of Joseph. And I want you to check this out. Go with me to the book of Genesis chapter 37. I'm sorry. Genesis chapter, let's go to Genesis. Uh, we'll go to chapter 37. Genesis 37. And uh, oh, man. Oh, man. You know, you may as well just get excited. <laughs> because. Wow. So check this out. When you're there, say amen. amen. Genesis 37, verse 1. The Bible says, And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his, fa wherein his father was a stranger in the land of Canaan. And these are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now, see, not only is Joseph a type of of, of Jesus, but we're kind of switching gears here a little bit, and I want to share with you something else. You see, Joseph um, was, was one of 12 sons. Are you with me? Just say amen if you're with me. Amen. amen. But, but check this out. His brothers, how many brothers did he have? 11, right? And uh, his brothers, 10 of them. Well, let me ask you this. Did they all have the same father? 
They all had the same father. Did they have different mothers? Yes. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right. So, Joseph, one of the 12, they were all his brothers. They all had the same father. No, 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 no. They all had the same father, but different mothers. No, no. Different mothers. Okay, all right. Let's keep reading. You'll catch us in a moment. Verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and made him a coat of many colors. So Joseph was like the new kid on the block. The other brothers had been around for a while. Wait, wait. The reason why they don't like Joseph is because he keeps the commandments of his father. Oh, man, you're not. <laughs> so check this out. Joseph, one of the 12, same father. All the brothers have the same father, but different mothers. They are his brothers from another mother. You know? The brothers, right? So, so Joseph has brothers from another mother. And these brothers from another mother hate him. Number one, because he keeps the commandments of God. Number two, because he has the spirit of prophecy. Yes, yes, yes. You remember Joseph tells him, hey guys, I've had a dream. And in this dream, the 11 come to the one. The 11 come, so, so the 11 are like, what? Us come to you? Are you crazy? Us but come, are, are, you, are you mad? And the Bible says they hated him all the more. And so, and so one day, one day, the father sends Joseph to go check on his brothers who are feeding the flock. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> and the response when Joseph, get, when Joseph gets on the scene, the brothers are like, oh, here comes that dreamer. Here comes that guy who thinks that he knows all about prophecy, who thinks that he knows what's going to happen in the future, who thinks that we are actually going to bring our sheaves to him. And they say, let's, let's get rid of that dreamer and see what becomes of his prophecies. Now, beloved, listen, Joseph, Joseph just, just loves his brothers. Hey, brothers, here I am. <laughs> and, and, the, and God has shown me this and this and this, but his brothers aren't excited about what he's telling them. I, I don't know if you, you guys look excited. <laughs> like you're thinking about something else while I'm preaching. <laughs> and, and so, and so uh, they hate him, number one, because he, 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 he keeps the commandments of God. And number two, because he has the spirit of prophecy. So, so they all are, are, are feeding the father's flock. And the father says, Joseph, you know, I'm concerned about my, about my other sons and I'm concerned about the flocks they're feeding. Joseph, go check on them. And when Joseph goes to check on them, they, 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 they catch him and they rip his garment off and they, and they say, you're not one of us. We're going to get rid of you. We're going to separate you from the father. Because, yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 no. You, you, you're out of here. Out of sight, out of mind. And then they say, let us see what becomes of his prophecy now. Are you? Heartburn, anybody? Heartburn? So, so, so Joseph goes away. He is sold. He is sold. And, and you see, beloved, the, the parallel is really quite amazing. Because you see, God has children everywhere but but he has a special child (laughs) 
And, and this special child, see, his children all have the same father, but, but unfortunately, there are different mothers that are involved. Because there are two women described in the book of Revelation. One is the true church, and one is the counterfeit church. Nonetheless, they all have the same father. Because there are genuine people in some of these, in, in many of these f other churches. <laughs> And God called his people upon a scene specifically in the year 1844. Go check on your brothers. I'm concerned about what's happening with the flock. Go check on your brothers. But when we got there to, to, to report, was, oh, dad, you won't believe what's happening. <laughs> Father, they're, they're not really feeding the flock. The brothers said, oh, yeah? Yeah, no, 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 you're not one of us. And by the way, what happened to Jesus is coming. Oh, yeah, I thought so. Let's see what becomes of your prophecies now. Just as Joseph's prophecy apparently failed. Oh, yeah, how's, how are we going to bow down before him now when he's all the way in Egypt? Just as his prophecy apparently failed, so God's people experienced a bitter disappointment. A book had been eaten that made the belly bitter. But it was sweet in the mouth. Let me tell you, beloved, here's what I'm trying to tell you. One of the things I'm trying to tell you is this. What keeps God's people in this time of discouragement is the sweetness of the word. What is to keep God's church in this time of trial is the sweetness of God's word. So just as Joseph, as he had gone into this bitter experience, the only thing that kept him was the, the knowledge of the prophecy that he had been given. So, what is Joseph doing while he is going? What is Joseph going through? May I share with you? Are you ready? Two things. Thing number one. Joseph is overcoming a harlot. Oh, God, I'm feeling me. <laughs> yes, a woman is trying to, to get Joseph to, to, to lie with her. But Joseph refuses to lie with the harlot. He refuses to be corrupted by the harlot. Very interesting. It reminds me of Mystery Babylon. Mother of abominations of the earth. Joseph is remaining faithful. He is overcoming. And you see, it's important for God, for Joseph to overcome, because God is preparing Joseph for something huge. You see, not only is Joseph overcoming the harlot, but then God does something. You remember, Pharaoh has a dream. You remember that? And in the dream, Pharaoh uh, sees seven ears of corn, uh, you know, healthy corn, and then seven, you know, uh, scrawny corn and uh, uh, ears of corn. And, and in this dream, uh, uh, the, 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 the seven um, ears of scrawny corn devour the healthy corn. And the same thing with the cattle, same thing. And he can't understand this dream. So guess who they end up calling? Joseph, hey, we know someone that can interpret dreams. So they call Joseph, and Joseph comes, and Pharaoh tells him the dream, and Joseph says, this is the dream. There is a time of plenty that is going to be followed by a time of famine. Here's what you must do. Gather bread. You're not feeling me, man. <laughs> Gather bread. Why? Why, Joseph? Why should we gather bread? Because a famine is coming. Oh, no. <laughs> so Pharaoh says, Joseph, I'm putting you in charge of gathering bread. Joseph's job now, in the time of plenty, is to gather bread. Just keep gathering bread. And more bread, and more bread. Why, Joseph? Why has God prepared you to gather bread? Why? Because the 11 are coming. Oh, no, 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 no. Mm -mm, mm -mm. The 11. 
Well, who, who are these 11? The 11, those who, who betrayed, those who, who told you that you were no good, those who told you you weren't really God's child, those who said, yeah, you guys don't even know what you're talking about, those who said, yeah, let us see what becomes of your prophecy now, the 11 are coming. A famine is going to happen. Your brothers from another mother are going to be coming. And when they come, Joseph, I want you to be ready to feed them. <laughs> A bitter time is coming for your brothers and for you. So Joseph, in a time of plenty, while things are good, please gather bread. Yeah, you know, but I'm so busy right now I, you know i don't really have time to gather bread like that lord the pastor gathers bread that will work will it not no 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 joseph listen you you got to understand something you see joseph i i know that you believe you may believe that that you're my favorite and you are you i mean i i love you but i love your brothers too and the reason that I'm allowing you to go through all this, Joseph, is not because I'm worried about you, it's because I'm worried about your brothers. And so I need to do whatever I can to save them, and therefore, Joseph, I am using you, not because, oh, you're my favorite, but because I love the other brothers. I love my other children. And Joseph, you are the only avenue. You are the one that is obedient to me. You are the one that I can use to reach them. So Joseph, it is important that you understand that in time of plenty, I need you to gather bread. Because Joseph, if you're not gathering bread in time of plenty, you are betraying the trust I have put upon you. I am allowing you to go through trials. I'm allowing you to go through conflict. Why? Because I'm preparing you for something greater. I'm preparing you to be my bread gatherer. So that when, the, when your brothers from another mother come to you, you'll be ready to give them bread. Beloved, how often have we had those experiences where one of our brothers from another mother came to us? I was just talking with someone just before this presentation. Pastor, what should I say if I only have five minutes to speak to us. How many of us wish that we had at that moment some bread to give? And I'm not saying this is the case for everyone, but how often do we find ourselves speechless? Why? Because we haven't been gathering bread. <laughs> Beloved, listen carefully to these words. You are Joseph. No, 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 no. You are Joseph. God has called you for such a time as this. Why? Because according to Amos chapter 8, verses 10 and 11, a famine is coming, not a famine for bread, nor a thirst of water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. Beloved, our brothers from another, another, not another mother may be laughing at us now saying, yeah, right, let's see what becomes of your prophecy. A Sunday law? Ha! Huh. How Joseph himself may have even been tempted to think, man, you know, how in the world can these prophecies come to pass now? Nothing is panning out the way that the vision said. How often are we tempted to think we don't see things going the way God has said? We don't see it happening that way. Can it really come to pass? Will it really happen? Beloved, listen to me. It will really happen. God's word will come to pass. So, why is God allowing Joseph to go through this? You see, beloved, in order for Joseph, listen carefully. Listen to what God is calling Joseph to do. God is calling Joseph to feed his enemies. <laughs> if your enemy hunger, feed him. But in order for us to get to that place, we have to become like Jesus. So you know what God does? God, check this out, God has Joseph to walk through the steps 
of Jesus. Joseph is the father's favorite. Betrayed by his brethren, sold for silver, descends into a pit, then becomes the second in command in Egypt. <laughs> God allows Joseph to walk through the experience of Jesus. Why? Because by beholding Jesus, you become changed. You see, beloved, let me, let me share with you something. The reason why God wants us to go back to the Bible, I believe the Bible is the beginning of our revival. Listen, we think the disciples were sad, and then they went to the upper room, and then they prayed, and then they got happy, and the Holy Spirit fell. No, that's not what happened. For 40 days before that, Jesus was giving them heartburn. So when they got to the upper room, they were already on fire. <laughs> they were already there. It was a result of Jesus in the Bible. So, but listen, the Bible says that the glory of Christ is, uh, the glory of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. Amen? And the face of Jesus Christ is found in the Bible. Amen? And if I want to behold Jesus, if I want to see Jesus, I've got to see him where? In the Bible. That means by beholding, I become changed. The more I behold Christ's face, when my face beholds his face, my face turns into the glory of God. It becomes, it reflects the glory of God. Christ's face is in this book. So my face in the book <laughs> I have to have my face in the book, face, book, <laughs> face, book, and the more that I face book <laughs> is the more the glory of God will be seen upon me. By beholding his glory, my face lightens up with that same glory. Now, by the way, beloved, the first angel's message is fear God and give glory to him. But listen carefully. You cannot give what you do not have. So how am I going to give glory to God if I don't have it? But I can't get it of myself. So guess what? I got to put my face in the book. And when I begin to behold Christ in all the scriptures, in all the stories, remembering that these stories are simply like cameras taking pictures of Jesus Christ, something begins to happen in my heart. Did not my heart burn when I opened up the scripture and Christ showed me himself in this story that I've never seen before. And through that, I get a glimpse of a part of Christ that I have never seen before. Did not our hearts burn? So, beloved, when I'm beholding the glory of Christ, when I'm beholding his face and his glory is becoming a part of me, then I can go out and reflect his image. Amen. Beloved, we have brothers from another mother who are hungering for the word of God right now. They're waiting for someone to come and say, hey, feed me, show me. I just spoke in a church. I was invited to speak in a uh, non-denominational church. And you know what I shared with them? I shared Jesus in all the scriptures. And let me tell you something. Oh man, let me tell you something. No mention of anything but Jesus in all the stories of the Bible. And the response was, give us more. Help us to understand this better. Help us to understand how, how we can study the Bible like this. Amen. Beloved, let me tell you, when we start lifting Christ up in all the scriptures, when we start making Christ the center of the three angels' messages, not just the book ends, the center. 
When we start making Christ the center of the Sabbath, the center of the state of the dead, the center of hellfire, when we start making Christ the center, I'm telling you, all men will be drawn unto him because he will be lifted up. But not only does God want us to, 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 to see him in the scriptures and to, and to experience the word of God because it will help us to reflect his glory, but here's the final thing. God wants us to experience his word because it is his word that will keep us in hard times. Yeah. Beloved, listen to me. Bitter times are coming. Yeah. And if we don't have the honey... When troublous times hit, we're not going to make it. Because it is only the word of God that will be able to keep us in those bitter times. Yes. Beloved, what are you doing with your time? Are you gathering the word of God while we are living in a time of plenty? Or are you waiting for the famine to hit? before you decide to start gathering. Because if you wait until the famine hits to start gathering, it will be too late. And the bitter experience will be too great of an experience for you to overcome in your own strength. Honey. Sweet as honey. Anyone know how honey, where does honey come from anyway? Ah, very good. Bees. Bees. Anyone know how bees make honey? Yeah, can I tell you? Who can I tell you? <laughs> you see, beloved, listen, bees... Look ahead. They know that a time is coming, winter time, that they will not be able to go out and get food. So what they do is before winter hits, they, they are out and they're going to the flowers and they take in nectar. Now nectar has 80% water. What the bees do with the nectar is they will, they will digest the nectar, nectar and then regurgitate it and then uh, take it in again and regurgitate it. And what happens is that every time they do this, they are getting rid of the water element of the nectar until it becomes honey. By the time it becomes honey, there's only about 10 to 15% water in it. So the honey is like nectar is watered down. Honey is solid. Yes. <laughs> Beloved, listen to me. Many of us read the Bible and all we're getting out of it is nectar. Yeah, you know, 80% water and a little bit of sweetness. Yeah, that was okay. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the problem. When winter hits, nectar is no good. You need honey. Beloved, listen to me. In the Bible, uh, uh, <laughs> it looks like nectar. But unless you eat it and step back, oh, no, let me eat it again and eat it again and step back. Oh, you know, I know, I know, I know I read this before. I'm going to read it again. And the more you read and the more you look for Christ in the scripture is the more you convert nectar to honey. Ooh. By the way, do you know what manna is? It was bread that tasted like honey. <laughs> Beloved, listen to me. You cannot survive on nectar. You cannot expect revival on nectar. You must find Jesus in the scriptures. He is the center of the book. And just like those disciples, the 11 that, that found Jesus, the 11 are coming. 
But beloved, they're coming because they are hungering and thirsting after truth. And we as a people who were at one time known as people of the book, must again become people of the book. And not just so that we can prove this or prove that, but so that we can show Christ as the center of all the scriptures. Beloved, you are Joseph. I am Joseph. We are living today in a time of plenty. It's time to gather the honey. It's time to gather the bread. Because a famine is coming, and when that famine hits, it will be too late. I promise you this. When you begin to look for Christ in all the scriptures, you will begin to experience heart burn. How many of you want to experience heart burn? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear Jesus for revealing yourself in the scriptures. Lord, we know that a judgment is going on now, that you're looking down to see two things, whether your people are gathering bread and how we treat one another. Lord, you've asked us to feed our enemies because they are really our brothers. Lord, equip us, empower us with your word. Help us open our eyes that we may behold you and that you may be known to us in the breaking of bread.